follow up to the open letter to the WGA from a WGA writer. So Ooh. there was an open letter. Um, the story is linked in there actually. And uh, a guy from the WGA said, this uh, union is a mess. It's been going downhill the last decade since 2019. It's been a, a death spiral. And the industry is now bearing the fruits of actions taken by the WGA. Um, so this person wrote a open letter. I think you may have covered it. This is the response to that. These are letters that were sent to Film Threat from WGA writers who some WGA writers and people from other guilds in Hollywood. And all what it talked about is how DEI has affected every level, including things like storyboard artists, production designers, editors. It's also infected the movie, the, the music industry and publishing. It is like, this is, this is basically um, it, it, it's a cancer on the arts is what this is. And the, the phrase male and pale is stale is something that people who work in development and film and TV, they often say. So if you're a, a white writer, one, they're just not willing to hire you. That's one. And number two stories are, um, the storytelling has changed. Um, now, so what we did was is uh, a lot of these writers reached out to us anonymously and wanted to tell their stories. They want to say, hey, I've been working in the industry. I'm seeing some changes that aren't positive. And so the following, I mean, it's pretty long, but it's gotten down to where people are being, people in the industry are being bullied to um, one, go along with the DEI training. And in one of the guilds, they call it Jedi training. I'm not making this up. There's screenshots on pages when you get deeper into this story. We have screenshots. Heard of that. Under the Jedi training. They kind of like mix up the DEI words. Anyways. Yep. And then also being, they're not saying, they're not being, if you're a new member who applies to the WGA, you have to fill out a demographic survey talking about your identity and you guys saw that that was from the story yeah, we showed that yeah, yeah that was yeah, from we also that was covered from, it on a separate video covering your previous uh previous yeah, so, story. so that was from a wga writer who took those screenshots so what they're doing is if you're a new member and applying you have to fill it out if you're an old member you are encouraged to fill that out and they they say it's not required to fill it out you're not required to fill it out but uh, one of the guys was telling me that he was badgered constantly getting emails. Con he saved all the emails because it was so incessant being badgered to fill out this form. They want to know the demographic breakdown of their guilds. And this is all for DEI stuff. So if you get deeper into the story, I wrote a little intro to kind of put things in context. And then each page is like one or two of these emails that we received. And they've been edited to... Uh, you know, for privacy reasons for the people who sent it to us. But uh, it's a very, it's long, but it's an interesting read. And when you get to the part in the screenshots about midway, you'll see the little graphic they made for the Jedi training. It's pretty weird. But this is how they're pushing it, pushing all this stuff. So um, I, I, I don't know if you want to read it right now or read parts of it. There's pull quotes. So to yeah, take us through that. Let's find the pull quotes and go through the highlights of what is said here. Yeah, yeah. I would I would flip through and, and look at the highlights and definitely look at those screenshots, which I think is on a, a page that's deeper in the story. We had to break. I mean, we had to break it up into parts, right? Like yeah. So yeah. Indeed. Uh, let's see. I can tell you're scanning it right now. Yeah, that I am indeed. Uh, let's see here, because here you write, I have a few stories that illustrate the hostility to non-diverse, that's called for white writers that may be yes, of yes, interest. Uh, number one, uh, writers hired on comic book shows are told it's a positive that they are unfamiliar with the original comic book and not a fan of the existing IP because they want to do a modern new take on the material relevant to today. 
Uh, two, writers are asked why this story today? How is it relevant politically today to the existing narrative they're publishing on our culture? And why are you the person to tell it? Because I have talent and wrote it is not a valid answer. What the valid answer is, because I'm a member of this aggregated group or class and only we can tell our own story. So that's the, that's the correct answer right there. And three, this leads to a heads we win, tails you lose game, where if you don't include diverse characters, you're dinged for having an all white slash non-diverse cast, regardless of the time or place of the story or historical accuracy. See, this is how you get the Woman King. And if you do have a diverse uh, cast, then you are guilty of cultural appropriation. This means that unless you are, for example, African American, you are not allowed to tell a story about an African American character, or disabled, or LGBTQIAP plus minus divided by side. Unless you are that specific subgroup, you can't write it. There's a bias toward the twofer or threefer higher. Being gay, for example, isn't enough now. Yeah, Tom has been harping on this for years now. You have to be gay and African American or Latinx or undocumented, unhoused, or differently abled. Then on the DEI scorecard, they'd have a two or three times multiple score for the higher. To give you an idea of how competitive things are, for only murderers in the building, there was a word a staff position was available. This is the lowest rung writing position. They received 450 scripts as writing samples for this one job. A manager told me these jobs would typically go to a BIPOC writer, but the show decided not to hire anyone or to go in another direction. And finally, the WGA has a diversity program where the guild pays for the diversity hire's salary. Most of the writers aren't picked up after the free ride expires. Many of these writers, hired only for diversity purposes, feel obligated to push stories that reflect the specific box they checked. So a transgender writer will be pitching stories exclusively about that experience. And then there's a quote that's highlighted here. Folks are on eggshells for fear of offending DEI standards, which are forever shifting. So yeah, I think this was a, a really, really good uh, write up here. That was just a summary. I'll do a video on the whole thing and every, everyone should of course go check it out. But basically here we have everything from you are not, uh, and you shouldn't be a fan of the material that you adapt because it has to be modern day and you better not be a right person or talented because they do not want that in the name of DEI. And of course this, to me, perfectly illustrates what DEI is, not in not in theory, perhaps, but in practice. It assures that the most qualified are excluded from the running. Yeah, you should um, show the page with the Jedi training, which is just a weird way to kind of trick people into like, you know, you have to go to this. They say everything is voluntary, but it's looked down upon if you don't participate. If, if that means anything. And this is constantly being pushed. So. Yeah. So where is it here? Do you have it handy, Andre? Uh, not yet. No, I'm on the same page as you. But give me a second. I'll see if I can find it here. Uh, since, again, it's yeah, the first it's, it's time we see it. And we are pages. on different pages. I just have to deal yeah. with, the, with the cookies, which I have found a way to bypass here. So. And it says DNI oh, is being weaponized, and that's not on that page. I think Alan is still like he's fixing typos on it <laughs> because I said, let's get it out now, you know, like yeah. let's not wait. So, oh, here we go. Here, I have it. I have it. I have it right here. So, yeah, okay. We'll have so, to try to zoom in. Yeah. I'm just going to put the uh, going to share it uh, share it here on screen, uh, which of course I take a couple of seconds on doing. This appeared in a newsletter to uh, one of the guilds, and 
Here we go. And because what you, what we're seeing right here is uh, is uh, is not too big to see clearly, but basically this is a flyer that says Jedi training, and Jedi, of course, is an acronym for Justice, Equity, Equity Diversity, Diversity and Evolution and Trainings. And then it says here, remember to put one of our upcoming Jedi trainings into your schedule. We encourage every ADG 800 member. Chris, what's an ADG 800 member? It's one of the guilds. Uh, take advantage of the training, which will be conducted through our partnership with Elevate Inclusion. Okay, so they work with one of these commie organizations, which is no doubt. I'm trying to remember where we heard of this before, was it? The was guild, it during the re The guild is the Art Directors Guild, but Art Directors is broad in the sense that it includes, you know, um, production designers, storyboard artists. It's a get art, the Art Directors Guild, or so anything involving that on a film set, film or TV set. Well, I'm trying to remember where we heard this Jedi thing for the diversity, equity, and inclusion thing. I think thing it was before. on FNT. Well, no, it was like part of, was it? Uh, it something else. I was going to say, wasn't it part of like Reimagine Tomorrow or something like that? Well, where we, they uh, it? Yeah, that was uh, that would have been uh, would have been something specifically to Disney, where they also had something about. I like, was going to say because I'm trying to remember because like, I know this is not new. We've heard this before. We have. It wasn't we not have a joke. It was before, serious, yeah. like a thing. Yeah, I think it was Reimagine uh, Tomorrow. I, I remember it too yeah. that we have, and also there was like the Star Wars writer, but again, he was also working under the the EI requirements, which basically were so that he made. In some book or something, he made Tom Solo say something along the lines of like real heroes respect pronouns or something. Something to that effect. So yeah, they they have that. I was just saying, because it's adding even more credence to this shit, which is just yeah. redonkulous. But yeah. yeah. But six put another article in uh, in the private chat right now, which goes hand in hand with this right here. Oh, let's because, see. It. Uh, because it would appear that the guild thought themselves really clever and smart for coming up with the Jedi acronym and thought this was really fantastic. Yeah, and this is back but, in 2021, so yeah, this would be yeah, about that same time, you yeah. Indeed, because Scientific American, they posted an article two years ago which says oh, why wow. the term Jedi is problematic for describing for programs that promote justice, equity diversity and inclusion with the subheading they're meant to be heroes within the star wars universe but the jedi are inappropriate symbols for justice work so yeah this article it also appears to be one we're gonna have problems with because and i don't like that they that they talk about justice when they should be talking about social justice because those are two very different things the moment you hedge or or put a, put a modifier to justice, it's no longer justice. And here it says, yeah. the acronym JEDI has become a popular term for branding academic committees and labeling STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine, initiatives focused on social justice issues, meaning they have nothing to do with STEM. If anything, they're anti-STEM if they're social justice. Used in this context, JEDI stands for Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. In recent years, this acronym has been employed by a growing number of prominent institutions and organizations, including the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Okay, Writer's Guild, you need to do freaking better because you didn't even come up with that shit on your own. Uh -huh. No wonder we told it before. At first glance, Jedi may simply appear to be an elegant way to explicitly build justice into the more common formula of DEI, productively shifting our ethical focus in the process. Jedi has important affordances, but blah, 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 blah. blah. Anyway, they find it problematic and you shouldn't do it. I believe that this is the... Because probably the Jedi and Star Wars are too white, I should imagine, or something to that, but something equally stupid. I mean, it's scientific American. There was a time when they used to be scientific, but, but recently they have been bigger followers of the science than actual science. So, yeah. Weird, weird. Indeed. 
So, well, Chris, I'd like to thank weird, you for, weird. for bringing this article to light. And oh, uh, before we move on, culture, unfortunately, has to be leaving us. So I have to ask you. So you your uh, on feelings this? on this, yeah. Yeah. Well, my, you know, my thoughts are I'm just not surprised anymore. <laughs> just, yeah. I, you know, it, it it doesn't matter what guild it is that they've all been under the 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 threat and hammer and sickle of what this all represents, and it's been going on forever in all aspects of entertainment. But it's even broader; it's in every element of the corporate world, and so on and so forth. And it's largely led to the demise of many things, and is now driving the layoffs and the and the uh, mass reductions in content that we're going to be seeing in the future. So don't let anybody mislead you into thinking that the strikes were the major component here. It's the fact that the consumption of the entertainment and the funding of the entertainment has now dwindled away, and you are now going to see a significant portion of the people putting all of this together no longer working in the industry. So well done. On that note, I'm out of here. Thank you for having me today. I hope take everybody care, does take time to read the article over there on Film yes. Threads and yes. uh, do check out uh, you know uh, similar things uh, on everybody's channels. Thanks for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Bye, culture. Take care, take care, take culture. Care. Thanks for joining I us. Mean, who 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 wants to work under those kinds of conditions if you're a creative person? Right. People who have no fucking talent, Paul. That's well, exactly who. The, the, you know, as we talked about with regards to the checkbox stuff. That's really useful low, for low talent individuals. Exactly, not, that's my it's point. Not useful yeah. for hot for talented people, and I, you know, I'd rather just sit here in my temple of doom here and write screenplays and sitcoms, which I continue to do. Some with Script Doctor, have a great old time, and uh, and see what we can do with it. I mean, to me, that's my preferred method. I I feel sorry for you know some you know the the individuals that are you know having to write this stuff i look even look at saturday night live and the mammoth expansion of of cast members i think they purposely expanded their cast members so the opening credits will go so far into the show that it'll be a much <laughs> smaller show and then the the writing crew is is just enormous um no you're 100 percent right paul and that's exactly it it's it, people who are taking advantage of it are people who have no talent but they're yeah. using whatever it is between their legs or on the color of their skin to get through the door. And as we're learning here over the past few years, they have no talent and people are not going to keep going to these crappy movies and watch these crappy TV shows, regardless of who they're representing or what their case is as far as having all these other hires. And it's, it's not just entertainment though. That's the part that's scary for everybody. We're learning that there, there's all these a group other of things people, in the last few weeks. There, there is, a group of people who are bound and determined to keep this going in hopes of finding an audience or an audience finally catching up with them. I'm, I'm determined. I'm, I'm absolutely certain that that's going on. You, you watch the number of people who are graduating from universities and colleges who I'm calling takers. We, we, one of the problems in our society is that there's only, and I talked about this before in a, in a video that the people who are paying for all of this are what I call makers. And the size of the maker community is diminishing. We've always had a support group that supported the makers. Education at one point actually uh, 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 developed useful individuals that could then be transferred over to the makers to help them build their businesses. Now they're not graduating anybody of use we've got feminist glaciation graduates from ober ober whatever the freaking university that oberlin and who's gonna who's going to um hire them and even in hollywood which in of itself is a weird uh taker group because do we really need block your ears everybody do we really need entertainment no no it's, it's not a requirement right. they make shit yeah. that we don't need it, it isn't required to live. However, humans like being entertained. And I would say to you, and no one's going to disagree with this premise, that uh, there's an awful lot of amazing makers that have developed within the context of this taker industry. The, the you know, the camera people, the, uh, uh, the, the technical stuff that is going on that's required to make a movie or a tv show is is actually interesting and staggeringly uh useful within that context 
So entertainment is a weird taker maker business, which I'm also going to be talking about in an upcoming video. But uh, the graduates out there uh, are not contributing to any of the makers. And as the maker business diminishes, as industries are being shipped off to China and other places, who's going to pay for this? At some point, you, you know, you've only got one group of people paying for all this mm -hmm. stuff. And well, no, you're 100% correct, Paul, and this is where we're at right now. These people are acting like there was all these people that were left outside the gate, right? And all these people that were left outside the gate were left outside the gate because of the color of their skin, a disability, or whatever was between their legs. That's the, the notion they're trying to sell to all of us. Well, it, at one point it it was. I mean, let's let's to a point you may be right, but here's my be argument: it's always been prejudice in terms. Cream of... has always risen to the top, right? The the cream right. of the crop has always risen to the top, and especially when it comes to entertainment and sports. And that's what sure. bothers me about this whole thing. And we were just talking about this the other day, Chris and I were uh, um about that whole thing too, where it's like, when did this start? Why did they start to think this way? Because sports and entertainment have been the only place where the doors have been wide open for years. Like maybe this, it may be this way in corporate America, uh, maybe in STEM research, but even there, I doubt it. Cause I've seen a lot of most scientists are nerds. So like, uh, I, I, anyway, I I, that, I've never seen any, you know, discrimination but, in the science community ever. Like, I don't understand this. Where oh no, they, I mean, they were hugely discriminated against women. Women. Like, yes. Huge, okay. Huge. I agree with you there. You're right. You're absolutely right. I, I'd retract. Major yes. Major discrimination. Respect, but there's a lot of black people and, and Hispanic people sure. and, and Asian people in the, in the scientific community for years was my point. And you even had Stephen Hawking who was disabled. Right. So like, again, I'm just saying it. Yeah. But he to was me, a white man. That's true. <laughs> if but... it had been a black woman in that wheelchair, never would have happened. <laughs> You're probably right. Six. <laughs> Unless the leaf a wheelchair levitated. But so the thing is, there's always been, been, you know, the friends rule. People are more comfortable uh, hiring and working with the kids that that the people that they went to school with, which is one of the things I tell people, don't go to school for the learning part, go to the school to uh, uh, get connections part. So, uh, you know, you've heard me say that don't don't go to some college in Wyoming. That's why you go to New York. And that's why you go to L.A. to make connections. So uh, uh, where was I going with this? So the, the, the point is like and here's an example. Uh, we were up for a major job in the UK for a very good web website business. And we were the most qualified group in the final list of candidates. And we lost it. We came in second place. Do you know why? You know what happened? I talked with the guy who made the decision and he said, oh, yes, you you were had that you had the best proposal, but I couldn't not give it to Chauncey. Because he was his best friend. In in in, in uh, you know whatever Eton or whatever the stupid university was in the UK, he just couldn't bear to not give it to Chauncey. So there's all there's always been an old pals network. Well, yeah, in that's business typical. and in Hollywood, especially in Hollywood, that you're never going to get rid of. Well, no, so, the old saying was it's always yeah. who you know, right? So yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But I guarantee you that if you went to some kind of film school in LA and there were a variety of people from different backgrounds. I guarantee you that you would not be excluding them. They would be your friends. You would be hiring them, hiring them because that's that's who your chums were. They were the ones who helped you with your assignment. I keep doing that. Exactly. That's yeah. a key difference right there because it, what what do you call this guy that he couldn't give it to? That he could not like could not not give it to? What was this guy's name again? Chauncey. Chauncey. Well, I'm sure that Chauncey even if he wasn't as qualified as you well, he guys. Was terrible. He it was, was a, it was horrible. He, he may have what was he good enough or was no, he horrible? not even barely good enough. Oh, okay. Well, then we're talking the exact same uh -huh. thing here because the big basically that is what DEI gets you someone who isn't good enough, which takes me to be That's a horrible thing. If they should happen to be good enough, then from the outside, no one knows that they're good enough or that they're just a diversity hire. And that Carry takes me on. full circle back to my original point, which was all these people that were acting that were being left outside were not because of their color of their skin or what was between their legs or any of these other things. It's because they weren't fucking good enough. That's why. And now that they know that they have an in, because I've talked to people where they flat out have said they're exploiting this shit, right? They're using this right now. 
Yeah, and not only that, like, like I like to hire friends, but I generally don't. What what ends up happening is I hire right. people that are best for the job, and then I become friends. I wasn't friends with Alan when we first started working together. I mean, I wasn't. I'm being honest. He may even be listening right now. You never know. We became friends later, you know, as we, I don't know, just worked together. And I well, learned. Same thing with Andre and I, yeah. Sort of an organic, natural thing. I almost always become friends with people I work with. But, you know, that's over time. And I think that's organic and natural and whatever. I really love working with Alan. I mean, like the more I learned about him, you know, it's just like, oh, he's a cool freaking dude. And we don't agree on stuff. And that's also part of why I like working with him. But um, I think hiring people, you know, there's that kind of works one time. If they do a shitty job, I'm probably tougher on a friend than I would be on um, someone else. Like I hired a friend of mine that I've known for years as a cameraman on a project. Uh, we did not we did not gel. Um, and I said, look, in the interest of our friendship, we can't work together. You know, like right. we just can't. So you find out it only you only can get. That so quote connections that works once you better be good at what you're doing. You better be really good. I'm glad you said that, Chris, because we do talk about nepotism and certain other things a lot when it comes to Hollywood, because it is full of it. But you're right. You still have to have some monochrome right. of, you know, talent to get past the, that door. Right. Like, right. It, it can open a door, but it can't make a career. I mean, there are plenty of people who, you know, have advantages like that, but then you got to perform. I do right. think that's where the merit lies. Um, so, and then there's certain people, you know, in writer's rooms. So I wish script was here because he could speak to some of this stuff, but like, you know, in a writer room, that's like, they, they contribute a certain thing. They're no, they've got, you know, they've, if you, once you read these letters and a lot of them are long, it's unfortunate I had to cut so many things out that could have identified some of these people. These are people that worked on big shows. These are people that worked on Emmy nominated uh, TV shows. Okay. So this is not just random people. Um, these people were sending us their resumes on IMDb. They told very specific stories, which I could not run, right. but you know, every single one that I interacted with said, we're going to do this anonymous. I appreciate you verifying your identity. However, the only way this stuff changes, the only way anything like this changes is if people speak out on the record. Yeah. If there are a number now, anyone that that's actually addressed in the story, one of the, one of the, a couple of the people mentioned, like, if you speak out, you are ostracized. You are bullied for having the opinion you have that this may not be the best approach. Right. So and this whole thing that came out where it's just like the WGA is actually paying for these writers to be on staff. And like when that free ride ends, they just fire the writer. And, and the problem is you don't develop that consistency. So you're getting kind of this group of people that just don't even know how it works. That's why I believe in order to really be in that writer's room in a meaningful way, you got to be around the industry for 10 years, a decade. Then you've, you know, you've, you've gotten notes. You maybe made friends with one of the writers in the room. We'll take a look at your script. You, it's like, you know, you've, you've been on enough shows to see how it, how it works, how, like, how, like in the course of 10 weeks, a writing staff can write all the episodes for a show and then be available while it's in production. Like it's, this is, this is, it's not like a thing you can learn overnight. I do think mentoring is a very positive thing. But you got a mentor. You can't just point to a person because of what they look like and say, okay, now you're, you're, it's your job now. Like that's not, that's, I mean, it diminishes exactly what the job is. So, and, and, you know, we've seen it in, in small ways, like affect the industry in small and big ways. I mean, look, there's a reason the term flop buster was invented. Right. So, I think so yeah. So I'm, I think this story will continue. Um, oh yeah. I want to yeah. jump onto something there that you mentioned though, uh, Chris, because sure. script has mentioned this before. And what you were talking about when you said the DEI free hire, what you're talking about is basically my understanding from what script explained was um, they had this deal where if you hired a specific writer that would hit one of these DEI points, they would actually give you money through the guild to have that writer on staff. Yes. Basically. So, so that's what you were talking about, basically. I just wanted so people knew what you yeah, were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's a program that the WGA has where they basically supplement. They pay for the writer in the writer room that is a 
a diversity hire. There's no other way to put it, right? But like exactly, when, when yeah. the person uh, said the thing about the twofer or the threefer, it's like not enough to have like one identity check mark. You have to have multiple, right? And that so it's just it's just a weird way to go about hiring people that puts the focus on the wrong thing. The focus should be on talent, developing talent, and getting people in the room who can do the work, who who can make a show that's gonna you know get accolades, get critic positive critic notices and then also positive more the most important thing audiences to watch right well not only that it explains where a lot of people are asking like well where do they get the money from or why do they keep hiring these people? that's the answer that's right, the right. answer that's, right there that's part of the answer yeah but it's <laughs> part for at least for that part of it yes but it's weird and then someone pointed out in the comments of the original the original story that ran uh, the open letter that they said they published a list like look at this list the top 100 shows are just from all these veteran writers. It's like, yeah, <laughs> for veterans. Imagine and that. Do this. And th so they look the top shows and it was all like the shows that you would think, but it was all from people who've been in the industry a long time. It's like, that's how you get to that point, right? You're in the industry a long time. And I think also- like I couldn't- is, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. Well, there is a, a thing to the mentoring in a decade. It takes, you know- I mean, and, and and you can debunk the thing about the 10,000 hours. There's some truth to that. You can, you can, you know, in 200 hours, you can, you can actually get a lot of experience, but 10,000 hours, you know, that's kind of, that's a good gauge. 10,000 hours of doing something to actually be decent at something, whether it's stand up comedy, learning a guitar or learning to write a screenplay, 10,000 hours, you know, how many hours a day are you doing <clears throat> on that? you know, toward that goal to, to actually even get to a 10,000 hour, you know, milestone. That's huge. Um, so yeah, sorry, Tom, you had another point too. So, um, no, you were, you were fine. I was just, uh, just agreeing with you and, 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 and supporting your points, but no, you're a hundred percent right. And this is an excellent, uh, report. Go ahead, Andre. Yeah, no, I just wanted to add in that this is actually like a universally recognized thing, even in psychology. That right. uh, if you want to be an expert at something, whether it be sword fencing or painting or songwriting or playing the piano, playing the L guitar, 10,000 hours of practice is what it takes. Yeah, yeah. Malcolm Gladwell is where I, I first heard that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's I, 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 well, it takes talent, but also you can train yourself, right? Like there is that. Yeah, that's the point. You can't train applying yourself. ability um, to if, it. If you don't have talent, then those ten thousand hours may not be enough. Well, and that's where I love the movie Amadeus, even if it's not totally accurate. Is you have the two dichotomies, right? You have Amadeus who just in his sleep could write, you know, a masterpiece, uh, and then what's his face? Uh, 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 I forgot the other guy's name now. <laughs> uh, but he he couldn't he you know he kept constantly working couldn't get nearly as much uh, recognition as Amadeus but anyway you know what I'm saying Salieri thank you uh, for the guys in the chat but anyhow um, yeah it's a very interesting story and I'm glad you brought it up uh, or brought uh, this to everybody's attention Chris at least busting it open the way you have it's amazing and uh, it's weird because a lot of this stuff is things we've heard in the past or just bits and pieces of and it's it's a uh, it's a, it's something I think that we're going to be seeing a lot more of. And I agree that until people speak out with their names attached to it, it anonymous, uh, not anonymously or unanonymously, is that a word? Yeah. Uh, but uh, to begin with, I'm very glad that these stories are coming out in the yeah. first place. Even if it is unanonymously, that doesn't really matter because the truth must be told. And now more and more people are wise to this. Elon right. Musk is dead against it. More and more people are becoming aware of what DEI truly is and how toxic it is. Next, people just need to realize that all DEI really is, is the S of ESG, which is the real enemy to society. But uh, yeah, before we yeah. move on here, uh, Chato, any any final thoughts on, yeah, uh, on yeah. this? Or six for that matter. Let's begin with, uh, with uh, you, Paul. Just unmute myself. I've been listening and, and <laughs> trying to keep myself out of the uh, out of interrupting. Well, I mean, I, I'm a creative person. I don't need anybody else. 
uh, I think the one thing about creativity, you know, very much falls uh, along the lines of what Tom was saying that, you know, if I do manage to uh, crack the formula here in my basement, uh, get one of these screenplays out there and made, and then, you know, the, the, the key is, and I tell this to kids, we know what they, they ask me, what's, what's the most important thing that you can do when you're trying to be a creative of any kind, whether it's an actor, writer, doesn't matter, is that you have to make yourself valuable to someone else. How do you do that? You do that by, uh, by taking lesson, acting lessons. You take that by writing lots of stuff to get over the initial hump of being a shitty writer. You do all of these things. You, you make stuff locally, plays, you act in plays, you, you promote those things, you get other people interested in your skill level and your potential. Your job is to make yourself valuable. It's the, it's, no one describes it that way. Everyone goes, oh, I got to be a good writer. Oh, I got to be a good actor. No, no, you, you can't be a good writer, a good actor, good director in isolation. Art, if, you know, art that doesn't make money is not art. I mean, it's it's just like, what's the value of it? Uh, well, that's a bit, you know, a bit harsh. But the thing is, someone has no, to value it. No, but you got a point. It. Someone has to value it and and see that there's value. So if I make myself valuable again, I was very valuable at one point in my career, and then I went off to become a computer programmer, and I was valuable to other people for other reasons. That's That's always what I've done, is that I've made myself of value to someone else so they will hire me. So in this new era of my of my life and I can sell one of these screenplays I'll become valuable to somebody and I'll jump the queue and I won't have to fill out this stupid uh you know form at all because people will go wow I can make money off of chato that's what I want that's what everybody should <laughs> That's <do>. why you're here <laughs> This clip was taken from Midnight's Edge in the Morning, which streams live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 9am Pacific Time on the Midnight's Edge main channel. There, you can send in your live questions and comments before clips and full stream replays are uploaded to Midnight's Edge live archives. We are also on Twitter, Rumble, Odyssey and Facebook, so smash that like, help share, subscribe and join us.